My name is Billy Munger. Some of you may know me as a racing driver. My challenge is an Ironman distance, 140 miles, 18 miles on the kayak, marathon, and the rest of that 140 miles is made up on the bike. And it's for an amazing cause, and that's obviously gonna play a huge part in it. It's, from a selfish point of view, it is just the, the challenge element and that competition within myself, seeing what I'm capable of, and help a lot of people and raise a hell of a lot of money. That, for me, it was like the full package of what I was after in life and what I was missing from 2020. So it was like, I had to do it. Racing for me, as a young boy when I was younger, like football, all of that kind of stuff, that's what all my friends were into, that's what they were doing. And I, I tried that, but at the same time I had racing always on my mind whenever I'd do that stuff. Like racing would have me as an eight year old up at six o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, shaking my dad in bed going, when are we going, when are we going, are we going into the track? It's just that, that adrenaline rush but also the calmness. You almost like don't really kind of realise what you're doing. You go to like another another place. And across the line to take the second win of the season, the man who won the opening race, Billy Munger. My accident, my second year in F4, just as we were sat on the grid, we were all on slick tyres, it was dry, and it, it started spitting with rain. Start of the race, didn't go to plan. Guys in front of me spun off. I had to spin to avoid the, the crash at the first corner. So I think I was down in like 14th, 15th place. So terrible start to the race. Started passing cars. I think I got up to about 11th after a few laps. I was making good progress and then came up the hill. Billy Munger having a look through passes. Jamie Sharp goes through on the inside line. So up into 13th place. You can see they're all scrabbling around for grip. Oh, oh no. Son. Oh, that's horrendous. That's absolutely enormous. He's just couldn't see him. Out of nowhere, they both, they dive out of the way, seeing the car that was stationary that had spun off. Unfortunately for me, um, I didn't have time to react, so straight into the back of the car that was stationary at 125 mile an hour. Everything came to a stop. I was still awake in the car. I was awake for about 45 minutes. Like At first, I could hear the guy I hit, he was screaming. So the doctors came over to me, I said, go over to him. I'm, I felt fine at the time. The adrenaline, the amount of adrenaline you have in the car, I really didn't feel any pain whatsoever when it first happened. As soon as they realised that I was starting to feel stuff, they were sort of in, making sure they injecting me and making sure that I was a bit like not really with it. Felt really cold all of a sudden where they had to cut all my overalls and stuff away. And um, that was sort of my last sort of memories of the accident. Then they put me into an induced coma and I went to hospital and the next thing I remember was sort of three days later waking up. From being in the car for that period of time anyway, when I was awake and seeing how serious it was and stuff, I kind of realised that like, when I woke up, I knew things were bad. So I think that in some ways helped quite a lot because it wasn't like I thought I was going to wake up and be completely fine. Obviously hearing the news and kind of looking down and seeing that, okay, that doesn't, you can tell it doesn't look right. There's, there's nothing there anymore. It's like a bit of a brutal awakening, but the person that made it easiest for me and kind of sorted me out um, from a mental side of things with my doctor um, who did the surgeries. Rather than closing my mind to what I'd lost, he opened my mind to what I still had. He made it quite clear that you are going to have to work your socks off if you want to be able to walk again, do all this stuff. This stuff that you can do doesn't mean it's going to be a given. It means you've got to work hard for it, but it's out there. It's, it's still there. I had people with me every minute of every day. Eventually it kind of, someone mentioned Alex Zanardi's name to me, um, who was a, a racing driver, competed in Formula One, had an accident similar to mine, lost both his legs, um, and he went on to racing again and kind of get back and compete. It wasn't like I heard that and was like, I have to do that. It just sparked that little bit of curiosity in me that went, oh, hold on a minute, he's raced again. Maybe there is a chance I can race again. I was sat in hospital going, okay, well, how would I do the, the throttle and the brake and this, that and the other? I was kind of like trying to visualise it in my head and how it would all, how it all work. After having talked about racing for a little while, it was like, oh, I've got to get back in the car. I want, I want to get back in the car. And as much as my mum was like, don't even think about going near a race car again, she could see that when I was starting to think about how things were going to work and how I was going to get back, how I would like light up, the spark and that passion came back into me and she, I think she it realised quite early on that 
it was going to be something I was going to do. It was going to make me happy, and that's all she she wanted to see, really. So it kind of just went from there. He's just taken 1.3 seconds out of them in the first sector of this lap. Uh, so there is Billy Munger. My relationship with Billy started about three years ago, roughly halfway through the first season back. It kind of became clear that you needed a little bit more help. The huge G-forces, you have to be incredibly strong to race a car in terms of core, shoulder strength, neck strength, obviously for going around the corners is huge, but also cardio. I think you'd be surprised just how high the heart rate gets and how hot the temperature gets within that car and the concentration levels for an hour. They're proper athletes. When I went back to racing the year after, rather than going back and doing F4 again, I continued as if I hadn't had that accident. I went up to F3, so I actually made a step up from where I was before. I have almost felt like people saw it as a bit of a sideshow in some ways, probably thinking, well, Billy's going to be struggling a lot, like round at the back. He's just there to to get out there, and, and that, that for me was never what it was about. I was like, if I go back to racing, I'm going to go back to win. I'm going to go back to show people what I'm capable of and to carry on chasing my dream. It has been a stunning performance from Billy Munger. He sees the chequered flag. He wins the 78th running of the Pole Grand Prix. What an outstanding drive by Billy Munger, the young man who was so cruelly injured in that terrible crash at Donington Park a couple of years ago, racing a Formula 3 car specially adapted with hand controls uh, to suit him. And that is one of the most outstanding races I have seen for a long, long time. I've got to thank the team, I've got to thank Carlin. I mean, I didn't ever believe that this would, two years ago, that this would be the case, that I'd be winning races. Um, and I'm just over the moon. The sort of idea around 2020, like I said, it was a year I wanted to challenge myself. Me and Andy just jokingly came up with the idea to do a mini triathlon. So like two weeks before we went to do this challenge, Comet Relief come to us and go, we want you to take on this year's challenge or 2021, early 2021, we want you to do this challenge, we want you to do an Ironman 140 miles. At first I was like, wow, that's insane. But it just came at the right moment where I was in such a groove with my, my training and I was enjoying that process a lot of getting better in areas that I knew I needed to get better in that I was like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm sitting here now thinking, why the hell did I say that? A marathon on its own is incredibly tough. 180 kilometers on a bike on its own is incredibly tough the 28 kilometer kayak, to put those three things together, it's, just, it's a mental, mentally tough. The main factor we have to look at for Billy is his stump health and having different prosthetics for different things and, and how one thing rolls onto the next. So any issues we might have on the bike will affect the walk. Any issues we have on the kayak might affect the bike. So it's trying to get everything in place. But every time we've been out, we've seen improvements and we're confident that that's gonna keep on Continuing. I've been through a lot of physical strain over the last few years and learning how to walk again, learning how to compete again. This for me is a challenge in general is probably going to be the toughest thing I've taken on since my accident. I'd never kayaked before and I'd never been on a bike since before my accident. Now I'm doing about 100, whatever it is, 10 miles on a bike so got a way to go. So guys, that right there is the finish line. I've just done 140 miles in four days. It's been the, the toughest, most exhausting, most incredible four days of my life. And uh, yeah, super proud and uh, thankful for your support. So uh, I'm gonna go to bed now. <laughs> and uh, no exercise for me for a few days. So thanks for all the support guys. And uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough. And I'll be honest, I never doubted as to whether Bill would do it. Um, knowing him as a character, um, I knew that he'd find it. I think it was a really good opportunity to show that he can do whatever he wants to do. There's no kind of limitations on, on that. I was always just thinking about how fit I'd need to be to do it and how much fitter I needed to get to walk further, to kayak further, to cycle further. But having done it now, it was easily 80% mental mental fortitude. As physically prepared as you are for something like we've just done, mentally I don't think you can ever 
quite comprehend how hard it's going to be until you're in that moment. Um, it's something that we spoke about, we always spoke about there was going to be one moment in that challenge that would define the whole thing. Um, and as tough as it would be at that time, looking back for years to come, that would be the moment that you look back on most fondly. When we finished the bike on, on the last day, that was the moment. I think it was about four laps from the finish. The legs really went to jelly and it was like, they, uh, it was just, they were done. Just under 10 miles left to go. And I was, uh, at that point I was like, yeah, do you know what, I think I'm, I'm done. I literally had to go, forget, I've got to forget everyone else is here and I just got to like, really go deep and zone out. I've never been so emotional whilst being like hurting as much as I was. Well, basically I had to almost draw on like every emotional experience that I've ever had in my life, like my accident, my friends, my family, the people we were going to help and that I've met from the charities, like all of that stuff literally came from like deep within and it was just like, oh, that's all I had on my mind as I was doing those last four laps and kind of stopped across the finish line, got off the bike, sat down and burst out into tears, like head in hands, like crying my eyes out, I couldn't. It was just like such a weird experience. I'd never experienced it before. Sort of was like, this is what you're gonna remember for like the rest of your life after having done this. And that was, that was it. Obviously being a competitor and athlete, you have to be selfish at times. You have to, like you're doing it for you. And as great of a feeling that is, as that is when it comes together and you've got, you can celebrate. I don't think I've ever experience such like euphoria and such pride in doing anything as in doing this for, for Comet Relief and doing it for for charity and hopefully changing people's lives in the process. Anything's possible if you set your mind to it and you just work, work towards it. Like don't ever let anyone tell you you can't do anything. Never say never. That, that for me that, that's what it's all about.